We are in consecration month starting today. What does that mean? Consecration means separation. It means holiness. It means that you used to belong to the world, but you have made a decision to serve the Lord. Hallelujah. We sing a song that says, I'll serve the Lord for the rest of my life. I'll serve the Lord. But when the rubber meets the road and when it's not convenient, I wonder if we just still run around, I'll serve the Lord. <laughs> when it's difficult, when you're losing friends over it, I wonder if it's so easy to say, for the rest of my life. But God is looking for a separated people. He's coming back for a bride who's not dating around behind his back. He's coming back for a bride who's made herself ready. He's coming back for a bride that said, no, I'm taken. And I belong to my bridegroom. I want to be ready when Jesus comes. Amen? Amen. I want to be ready when Jesus comes. And so we are in consecration month where we rededicate ourselves to the Lord. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, speaking of holiness in the 14th verse says this, follow peace with all men. You don't have to get in fights unnecessarily. Yeah, it's awfully quiet. You don't have to pick a theological fight, but you can follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Now, I wanted to bring this scripture to your attention in view of consecration month. We are fasting, we are having special prayer, and we are setting ourselves aside for holiness, for reconsecration, rededication, and a renewing of our sacrifice to him. But the word see, now, I grew up having this scripture pounded over my head that basically holiness or hell. And, and as a matter of fact, that's what I call some of the folks that, that I grew up with, holiness or hell folks. And it was so scary because their idea of holiness was, was specific to their church. So you had to figure out what their code looked like and what the sleeve length was and what your hair was supposed to look like and how you were supposed to dress and, and, and all of these things. And, uh, do you know, some folks couldn't even have a Christmas tree, so you had to find that out if you went to a different church and, you know, all these different things. And so their idea of holiness was external. In other words, you better be doing things so I can figure out whether you're holy or not. But I found out somewhere along the way that it was in the Bible all along. Samuel put it this way. He said, God doesn't look on the outward. He looks on the inward, on the heart. Paul put it this way. He said, God is no respecter of persons. And so I found out that holiness wasn't about the external. Of course, with what God has shown us, we realize that these old, you know, this old thing is just a temporary vehicle just here for a few years that is allowing my eternal soul where holiness really takes place to breathe air and to walk around and to exist in this world for a few years until my testing and my training time is over. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. And so we have come to understand that the external is so minuscule in what God considers. And when we look at holiness, he's looking at an inward condition. But nevertheless, I had this pounded uh, into my head that, you know, holiness, we've got to be holy if you want to see the Lord. And of course, that meant if you want to go to heaven because it was holiness or hell. Yeah. Holiness or hell, folks. Yeah. And so first off, I'm thankful to know that I've got to have a condition of holiness on the inside. You know what that means? Now, I do believe that by their fruit, you shall know them. I believe that. I believe that you can look at someone's life and look at their fruit, but it takes a minute to be able to tell if somebody is bearing fruit. You can't really just walk up to somebody because, you know, we learn to speak the language and to dress the part. 
Amen? Amen. So that, I mean, I, I am talking about, I have known people that have given Academy Award worthy performances. You would have thought they were the most holy, amazing woman of God, man of God, just walking, you know, just floating basically two or three feet off the air, off the ground, and, and just think that they were amazing and the way people, other people were, were you know, uh, treating them and the respect and everything. Come to find out when you looked a little bit beyond uh, the external and looked under the hood, so to speak, there was not a condition of holiness on the inside. And so I've come to tell you, it's a, it's a little more involved than just dressing apart and speaking in certain ways. It's a little more involved. It takes a sacrifice. It takes a setting aside. Hallelujah. And we know that holiness comes with a price. But the, the reason I wanted to share this scripture with you today is because the word see, just a three-letter word, seems, you know, so insignificant. We use that word all the time. I see you, uh, you know, let's go see something. However, it's crucial to understanding this scripture because that three letter word in English is the Greek word optonomai, optonomai. And it changes our understanding of the whole scripture because what it really is being said here is that holiness is necessary to optonomy the Lord. Without holiness, you cannot optonomy the Lord. Here's what that word means, optonomy in the Greek. It means to gaze with wide open eyes as at something remarkable, not simply voluntary observation or merely mechanical, passive, or casual vision. It is an earnest and continued inspection. So now you understand that holiness brings you to a place of intimacy with God. Holiness without which you can't really see the Lord. I can see something over there, but, you know, my vision's not what it used to be. And when I get closer, I experience it completely in a different way. And so that's what I want you to understand. Holiness is all about intimacy with the Lord. And can I tell you, he's coming back for a bride who's made herself ready. A bride who has chosen to be holy and righteous in his sight. The kingdom of God is what? Righteousness, according to Romans. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Amen. So that is what we're doing this month in Consecration Month. Frankly, this scripture has just been stuck in my mind, and, uh, and so I want to share that with you as well. 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, the 9th, uh, 19th and 20th verses, it says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Hmm. It gets worse. <laughs> Verse 20, for ye are bought with the price. Mm, Got to bring that up. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, let's think about this for just a moment. Here we are talking about the horrible sacrifice that we're going to have to make to be holy and to not uh, belong to the world and to set ourselves aside for God. Really, the fact of the matter is you don't even belong to your own self. But you're bought by the blood of Jesus. You're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Here's the deal, though. God wants a willing bride. He's given you free will. And he said, even though I purchased you, even though you shouldn't have the right to do anything except what I want you to do. Here, I want to give you free will because I want a bride who's in love with me. I want a bride who chooses to be true to me, who chooses to be uh, consecrated and set aside for me alone. So that scripture has just been with me for a few weeks that I don't belong to my own self. And as we step across the threshold in obedience to God, I believe that we need to embrace the fact that when the Lord says, I've got something for you to do, it should not be up for discussion. I believe that 
there are some ministers under the sound of my voice who have embraced a commission in 2016, who have embraced a calling and an anointing for such a time as this, but you're acting like a teenager. And you need to grow up today because you've accepted a commission with high anointing and authority, but you're acting like a big baby. When the orders come across, the answer is yes. Not, I'm not ready for that. Not, how's that going to work? Not, that doesn't really fit with what I had planned. Not with, I'm not comfortable with that. You did not have to accept the commission. But you said, yes, I was here and I will pull the video. <laughs> it has got to be frustrating being in this church with this pastor. Because, <laughs> you know, a lot of folks stay in intense moves of God because there's a dictator in charge. I've been in those churches. And the dictator scares the bejeebers out of them, out of those folks, so that they just know if they step out the door, they're just going to step right down into the pits of hell somehow. I mean, I had pastors that had us convinced if we went across town to another church that believed almost exactly like we did, you know, that we were lost. Uh, but, but that's how a lot of folks are retained in a church where there's a move of God. Stick with me today. I'm going somewhere. And, but, but see, God is moving in a different way where it's not enough to be afraid of what is going to happen. We ought to fear God, but we shouldn't fear the human beings that God has put in our path to lead us. We shouldn't fear our pastors and our leaders. We shouldn't fear, but we should did you know that God has not given you the spirit of fear? If you've got fear, then that didn't come from God. I don't know about you, but I don't want anything rolling around inside of my mind that's not of God. And so if you need a New Year's resolution, how about expel the fear in the name of Jesus? In the name of Jesus. Do you know what's going to happen? Along with that fear is going to go the doubt. <laughs> Every bit of doubt is attached to that fear. And when you stand up in the name of Jesus and you say, no, that's not from God. And so I'm not going to allow that in my, uh, my, my being. I'm not going to be made up of that. Did you know that as the heart thinketh, as, as the heart thinketh, as the mind and the heart, you know, the heart is really who you are and when you're thinking and you know there's emotion and there's there you know this is this is uh we, we point to our minds up here and this is your brain but did you know that one one day that brain is going to die or it's going to be changed one or the other when the lord comes so this physical brain is not who you are but you are processing things through this physical brain I think that we've begun to grasp some of that, the flesh versus the eternal soul. Your brain, your, your, the, the cognitive abilities and the electrical impulses and the synapses and things that are functioning in your brain to allow you to process information, that's all going to be gone one day. But you have a soul inside of you. And so, but you've got to understand that what you let in becomes part of who you are. And so if you, you know, some folks get comfortable in the fear. I preached a message about that, comfortable in the fear. And you, you begin to learn to function somehow. Sometimes we like the attention that being afraid brings to us. And it becomes an act of selfishness to hold on to the fear. Why? Because, oh, I'm afraid. And all I've got to do is say I'm afraid and everyone's going to give me some love. Everybody's going to stand around me and protect. How long have we been standing around you and protecting you? When are you going to grow up and begin to nurture somebody else in the things of God? God is calling us to grow up into the things of God. Hallelujah. And so we're not our own, but we're bought with a price. 
Hallelujah. I shared with you uh, last year, early in the year, a message uh, called The Vision. If you're watching us online, you might want to reference that message. But we went to a scripture in Proverbs, the 29th chapter in the 18th verse. And I want to share this uh, scripture with you as well. We're, we're going down a little bit of a curvy path, but we're going to go uh, into the meat of what I have to say very shortly today. But I want to remind you that the Word of God says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, the people perish. What does that mean? Well, vision is the Hebrew word kazon, and it means literally prophecy, revelation, and divine communication. So what is the word telling us? It's saying that if there is not new revelation and divine communication in your church, in your walk with God, in your ministry, then something is in the process of dying in you. I've seen churches all across the country in the process of dying spiritually. You might as well put Ichabod across the door of the church because Laodicea is a church that is not interested in revelation, in uh, vision, in hearing the things that God is speaking. But today I've come to tell somebody that is hungry for God that he never quit speaking, that he never quit revealing, that he never quit communicating to those who are hungry and thirsty for what he has to say. Jesus spoke to the end time church. And if you're wondering who that is, you're looking at it right here. Here, the end time church. Jesus in the book of Revelation said, let him that hath an ear, somebody that wants to hear, let him hear what the Spirit of God is speaking in this day and hour. And so we have gone through various stages in the last couple of years in this church. This is not the church that we were 15 years ago when we started on uh, the, the Country Inn and Suites uh, uh, Banquet Room on Shea Boulevard 15 years ago. Some of you uh, were there in the first year of our church. I believe Brother Dennis and Brother Nate are the only ones besides myself that were in that very first service. There were only 12 of us, but here we are 15 15 years later and this church doesn't look anything like it did back then and the things that God is doing are so far beyond the scope of what any of our planning sessions addressed back then can I tell you that somehow some way God looked beyond the exterior he looked beyond all the strategy and the planning and he saw somebody that was hungry for God and he began to draw others that wanted to have something new and something fresh and to hear a word from God and it brought us together can I tell you that we've had a revolving door over the years because people who were curious about the miracles people that were curious about the folks being delivered and healed and changed by the power of God that were curious about the deliverance the alcoholics and the drug addicts coming in under addiction and leaving delivered by the hand of God people began to get curious about what was going on but can I tell you once they got in and they saw that it was a little more than just the flash and the smoke and mirrors and the things that so many people seek after I'm not saying that the miracles weren't real but I'm saying that there's something deeper that has been going on in the hearts of people that God has drawn together because they're hungry and thirsty for him and the folks that came in for the flash of the miracles and the deliverance and the things that God, you know, that, those are the things that, that, uh, get the, that draw the crowds. I've known people that, that bought motorhomes so that they could follow the flash of miracles and signs and wonders. But can I tell you this? Jesus never said that you're going to follow and drive around in a motorhome looking for signs and wonders. He said, these signs shall follow those that believe in my name. They're going to lay hands on the sick and they're going to recover in my name. They're going to cast out devils in my name. They're going to speak with brand new tongues. But the signs and the wonders follow those who really believe. 
And somehow, some way, God has, has drawn together some folks who are just hungry for the real thing, who don't care about pretense. My goodness, you know, in this community full of a bunch of folks that are just steeped and soaked in pretense, somehow, some way, God looked down beyond the surface and he brought some people together that really had a heart after the things of God or that really wanted to hear what God had to speak to them. And can I tell you, it has come with a price. Can somebody say amen that it has come with a price? Every time that God has begun to reveal his word and begun to speak in a way that we've never heard before. You know what it does? It separates the hearers from the crowd a little further. A little further. Suddenly, your friends are wondering what in the world is going on because your conversation changes and your vocabulary changes and the things that you're excited about are beginning to change because you're beginning to fall in love with Jesus. You're beginning to embrace revelation from God. You're beginning to hear from the Spirit in a non-traditional way. Can I tell you that it costs something to step into the things of the truth of the Word of God? It costs something. The Word says you've got to buy the truth and sell it not. There are been plenty of people who've seen the flash and seen the brightness of the miracles and came in and embraced the truth for a minute. Oh, but the price began to weigh on them and the price began to bother them. And you know what? Even though they may have bought the truth, they sold it to the highest bidder and moved on out the revolving door. The price of truth is going to be consequential. And so this is not new information in this church. This is not new information. If you've heard us preach over the last two years online, you know that we have preached this message many times about the price of truth. But I'm coming uh, to the point here in just a moment. You see, we've been through several iterations uh, that God has spoken to us. We came to a place where I preached a message that we better all speak the same thing, that we had better get ourselves uh, in alignment uh, because we've got to be in one mind mind and one accord if we really want to be in sync with what God is doing. I began to tell folks something that you know any pastor would probably be out of their mind to say. I began to tell folks maybe this isn't the church for you. Maybe there's another church where you'd be a little more comfortable but we're going to follow God and if we don't have the crowds we're going to still hear what God has to speak because we're hungry and we don't care about what we look like. We don't care about the measure that you use to tell whether we're successful as a congregation or not. We want to hear what God is speaking no matter what the price. And so we, we begin to talk about speaking the same thing. If we, if we're, get, we, we're either getting revelation or we're not. We're either hearing from God or we're off the reservation somewhere. Amen? Because God is not schizophrenic. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. But what I've seen is hunger increase. What I've seen is revelation begin to be integrated in the hearts and lives of the people of God in this church. I've seen you change because you've been changed by the word of God. I've seen you change because the revelation began to be integrated inside of you. I heard your conversation change. I heard the preachers get up time and time again in 2016 and begin to preach in a different way, in a deeper way, in a way that was completely changed and different from anything I heard from them. Why? Because they were changed by the word of God. I began to see assimilation of the word of God in the hearts of people. And then the Lord began to speak to us about the power of God. We've always been a church based on the power of the Holy Ghost, preaching the message of Holy Ghost power. Acts 1 and 8, if I've preached it once, I probably preached 
preached it 150 times uh, over the years uh, that you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost uh, is come upon you uh, and you shall be witnesses. Uh, the power that God has called us to walk into uh, is uh, the power of the Holy Ghost. Uh, and then he began to talk to us two years ago uh, about Basilea, about the kingdom of God. Uh, that uh, once you're saved, uh, once you're washed in the blood, uh, once you've given your heart to God, uh, that's fine. Uh, but that's wonderful. But that's the first step. Uh, and then, uh, according to Matthew, the sixth chapter and the 33rd verse, uh, Jesus said, uh, the next thing on your agenda, uh, the next thing on your checklist uh, is to begin to seek first uh, the kingdom of God uh, and his righteousness. Uh, throw everything else out the window and begin to seek Basilea. If you don't know what it is, uh, find out what it is. Uh, that's why we've been teaching uh, and preaching uh, with everything we've got uh, about Basilea, the kingdom of God. Basilea being the Greek word uh, for the kingdom of God. Uh, we've begun to learn things uh, that we never knew before. Uh, things that have never been preached to us before. Uh, I'm not saying God is not speaking elsewhere. Uh, all I know is what he's doing here. And so we've done everything in our power to obey the words of Jesus when he said, seek first the kingdom of God because we know the result. All the stuff that we have been messed up with and other churches are so consumed with, all of the provision things, you know what? It's all taken care of when you seek first the kingdom of God because Jesus said, and all these things will be added unto you. You don't have to worry about provision when you're seeking the kingdom of God. And in that, of course, we know that in Romans, the 17th chapter, the 14th verse, it says this. It says that the kingdom of God, Basilea, is not meat and drink. It's not about the rules and regulations. It's not about, you know, trying to live up to certain standards. It's not about following all of those things. But what is it? It's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. If you're trying to seek after Basilea and you're not doing it through the power of the Holy Ghost, you're not going to make it. The door will not be open for you. Come on, somebody. But the first thing that you ought to do is begin to seek the Holy Ghost because that's where you receive the power. That's where you receive the anointing that you need in order to step into the place of Basilea. Somebody say amen. So we preached about the power. And then uh, somewhere around the first of the year in 2016, the Lord gave Brother Dennis Shave a vision. And through that, God spoke to me and gave me an interpretation. And we've been preaching for this entire year about guidance systems. About the power going in the direction where it's supposed to go. Because power is wonderful, but if power is off track, then it's not going to hit the mark. And we begin to preach about all of that. If I preached once, I preached a bunch of times that the door is going to be closed. That the foolish virgins missed the boat, so to speak. And that's a good analogy because Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, hallelujah, and the ark had a door on it. And you've heard a lot of preaching that God was the one that shut the door. And then it was too late. And so you heard a lot of preaching that we're looking for a door. You heard preaching that Jesus said in the third chapter of the book of Revelation that to the church of Philadelphia, come on somebody, to the church of Philadelphia, not the church of Laodicea, but to the church of Philadelphia, behold, I put before you an open door that nobody can shut. And so you've heard a lot of preaching about an open door that is temporarily open, but God will shut one day, and I believe it's coming soon. Also, I want to draw your attention to another door today. In Matthew, the seventh chapter and the sixth verse, Jesus said this, give not that which is holy unto the dogs. You heard some preaching about this, some teaching about this with regard to revelation. By the way, read this chapter in full. It is an amazing chapter about Basilea and Jesus teaching about Basilea. The, the, the verse says, give not that which is holy unto the dog, speaking of your revelations that God has spoken to you. Neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Look at the next verse says, ah, 
ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth. You mean it's not reserved for the ones who've served the Lord for 50 years? No, everyone, everyone that asketh receiveth. He that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. We've experienced this in the last couple of years because we've been preaching that you've got to seek first the kingdom of God. You didn't have to seek after salvation, but God was seeking for you. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. You could not have been saved except that the Holy Ghost began to draw you. The Spirit of God began to draw you to salvation. There's a song that Brother Nate wrote that said, when I could not go to him he came to me hallelujah Uh, and so I'm thankful for that but you see the whole equation flips around after salvation once you've given your heart to the Lord then he said if you want to go further then you've got to seek after me and that's what we've been doing the last couple of years. What am I preaching today? I'm preaching about the vision of where we are and the church uh, where God has us here in this uh, first day of 2017. Praise God. You know, there's some some folks who didn't wake up today. There are a whole lot of people in the news, even in the last few weeks, celebrities who did not, are not around today. But thank God that he put breath in my body for another year. Thank God that I could have been uh, in, in a terrible fate. I could have been in a terrible situation. But thank God I've got another year to serve him. Thank God I've got another year to seek after him. Is anybody grateful in this house today? So we have seen a living, breathing example in this church that all we had to do is seek and knock and the door was opened. The door of Revelation, the door of Basilea was opened unto us. Thank God that it's for whosoever. There's not some list. The Bible said that many are called, but few are chosen. But the delineator there is not that he closed the door in somebody's face. No, he said everyone that knocks is going to have the door opened, the door of revelation open to them. Aren't you thankful for that? That God didn't say, you know what? You're just not quite smart enough. You don't have the education that you need to understand my revelations. Aren't you thankful that God didn't put any of those measures? He just looked at the desire in your heart. And he said that everyone that asks is going to receive. Thank God for revelation that has been poured out in the last couple of years. We've begun to see things as we never saw them before. We began to see the word through brand new eyes and brand new anointing and brand new revelation. Let me take just a moment to say this, that if you're in a church or under the uh, pastorate of somebody that thinks that you're going to go up and out of the word of God to get revelation, get up, get out, and find somebody that is rooted and grounded in the word of God because there is no truth outside of Jesus Christ he said I am the way I am the truth I am the life he said nobody is going to get through the door unless they come through me as a matter of fact he said I am the door and so if you're trying to get there some other way then I I can tell you today you don't have the truth if you're up and out of the word of God you're delusional you don't have the truth because Jesus is the truth in the beginning was the word the word was with God and the, the word was God the word was made flesh and dwelt among us his name is Jesus somebody say Jesus is the truth so you cannot separate the word of God and Jesus and the truth they are all synonymous so I've got to say it one more time I've got to declare it that every revelation is going to be rooted and grounded in the word of God it will not contradict any other truth that is in the word you see what happens is when we begin to let go of things that we thought we understood the entire word of God begins to be illuminated with revelation. It's not that, well, I'm going to throw all this stuff out. You know, I see this in our community. I see this in those who have become affirming and accepting. And it is, it is, it is sad and vile at the same time. These folks that are 
I, I hope they're well-meaning, but these folks that are beginning to preach this mess that you don't really have to pay attention to the Bible. These things are outdated. This is possibly not even the Word of God. I've had people that I, I have walked with in ministry even say that I don't believe the Bible is the Word of God. And so we, we are just understanding new revelations outside of, and so we're going to embrace, embrace all kinds of different religions. No, I've come to tell you you're going to be sadly disappointed when Jesus comes again because the truth is coming back. Hallelujah. The truth is coming back for somebody who has stood fast in his word. Somebody who has stood fast and held up the blood-stained banner and preached the word of God without fear or favor and without compromise. And so when I talk about revelation, I'm not talking about moving outside of the word of God. You better get yourself rooted and grounded in the word of God. Hallelujah. There's seducing spirits that have been loosed. And I fear that some folks under the sound of my voice have been targeted by seducing spirits. You better get on your face before God and get yourself established in his word once again. Hallelujah. And so we've seen these different doors. This door that I just spoke about, the door of revelation, the door that the Lord promises if you just knock on it, if you're just hungry for it, if you just seek after me, guaranteed you're going to hear from me. Guaranteed I'm going to open that door. You know what that means? That means if you're not getting revelation from God, somebody that's watching me online, pastor, hear me today. If you haven't received new revelation, a new communication from God, something you've never heard before, you're not seeking the things that God has for you because he promised all you've got to do is knock. All you've got to do is seek and you will find guaranteed, guaranteed. And so my, the cry of my heart is, God, give my community, give my generation desire to seek your word, to seek revelation. But today, in the next few moments, I want to bring to your attention the other door, the other door. And this is going to define, RPA, this is going to define where God is taking us. God has spoken to this pastor about where he's leading this church in 2017. You see, we've spent two years not just hearing about the revelations, but uh, like I was saying earlier, causing them to become part of who we are. Somebody say amen. Amen. It's changed the way that we worship. It's changed the way that we talk about things. It's changed the way that we preach and teach. It's changed the way that we uh, pray for people. It's changed the way that we uh, step into our calling and our commission. It's changed everything that we know or everything that we thought we knew about the things of God. It has become a part of us and we've spent two years growing in the revelations of God. Hallelujah. To, to the point where it's just second nature. I mean, when we go out to Denny's, somewhere along the way, the revelations of what God is talking to us about the bride and the book of Revelation and all those things, it's going to come up at Denny's. Because folks, you know, the word said, out, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And, and so... <laughs> So, you know, it's become part of us. We've been growing up into these things for the last two years. But God is speaking to us today about the other door. Turn with me to Colossians, the fourth chapter. And, uh, and we're going to go back to this in a moment. Colossians, the fourth chapter and the second verse. It says this, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Now, just in case you haven't been paying attention, all of the uh, teachings on the bride, the teachings on Basilea, all of the parables of Jesus, Matthew the 25th chapter, Matthew the 7th chapter, the punchline, the takeaway, the teaching that God is speaking, that that all of these uh, examples are bringing to us is very simple. Jesus said, I said all of this to tell you, watch and pray, watch and pray. And here Paul reiterates that you've got to continue in prayer and watch in the same. And so it's not enough 
to just pray and then, you know, forget about everything, but you've got to watch. What is it that we're watching for? Well, let's go a little further in this passage. The third verse says, with all praying also for us, look at this, that God would open unto us a door of utterance. What is the door of utterance? Lest you be mistaken, it's very clearly delineated right here. It says, to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I also I am also in bonds. So I'm preaching to you today for 2017 that there's another door that has different rules attached to it. Because the door of utterance, which is the door to speak the mysteries of Christ, that door is not just as simple as knocking and having it open. No, Paul, who said, I'm a steward of the mysteries of Christ, he said, would you please pray for me that a door of utterance be opened by God himself. The word utterance is the word logos. It is, it could not be clearer. It literally is the revelations of the word of God. The door of logos. The door of utterance of the revelations of God. Now, um, many of us have experienced along with, you know, walking and growing in these revelations, many of us have experienced that when we tried to communicate and when we tried to impart and when we tried to share these things with people that we loved and, and with others, we found we hit our heads against a brick wall. And it was so disappointing to many of us. We didn't know what to do. We were so excited. We were so changed. We were so uh, just, just amazed at what God was doing. We were just completely convinced that everybody else would feel the same way. Am I lying or am I telling the truth? And we just knew if we would sit down and just begin to bear our soul that people would begin to weep happy tears of revelation and, and do happy revelation dances and begin to see things like we've seen them and just be changed. And yet we found that the door was firmly shut. Paul said, would you pray for me that a door of utterance be given that God would open the door of utterance. Can I tell you today that God is the door opener for the door of logos? And so what is about to happen, you see, here's what God wants you to understand. You were not prepared for the logos door to open. You were not ready, and if that door had opened, you would have messed it up. That's why God said, nope, I'm not opening the door yet for you. I've opened the door of revelation because you knocked and I promised that I would open that door. But there's another door. I'm preaching about the other door today. Hallelujah. There's another door. But God said, no, you're going to need to marinate in my word a little bit. You're going to have to walk through the challenges of the revelations and the mysteries of Christ. Can I tell you that the word of God said, great is the mystery of godliness. Can I tell you that God has hidden revelations? We heard the scripture in Daniel that said that there are things that from the foundations of the world God has hidden from all but those who are hungry and thirsty and seeking after the things of God. You see, not all truth is for everybody. Not everybody is going to walk into the deep places of revelation. It's available. But I told you, it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you something. And you're going to have to seek after those things. And so, but, but here's what, a lot of us spent two years sifting through everything we thought we knew. And having to, you know, I don't know about you, but, you know, the new, new year around our house is going to be getting rid of clutter. And we've talked about that. We're going through closets and we're, you know, we've already done a lot of that. But we found out that there are some things that we hadn't even seen in 10 years or so that were just packed away in boxes and, and we didn't need in our everyday life. And all it just became was clutter. 
And so in order to make room for anything, you know, you can't, it just is, it's impossible to bring in something nice and new if all, you, all the space is already taken up. I believe that we need to simplify in the realm of the spirit. I believe that we need to look into those closets of clutter and those things that we thought we needed to hang on to, that condemnation that somebody tried to impart to you that never belonged to you in the first place. I believe the Holy Ghost is speaking to us to begin to pull those boxes down and to begin to pull down those things that you embraced, those things that you listened to and you allowed to to just become part of your spiritual household it's time to say Lord I'm ready for some new I'm ready God to hear your voice to hear your word but I realize I'm going to have to get rid of some clutter that guilt is going to go in the name of Jesus. That condemnation is going to go in the name of Jesus. That judgmental spirit has got to go in the name of Jesus. That fear doesn't belong to me in the name of Jesus. That doubt has got to go. That spirit of, of feeling like I'm inferior. Not because a preacher pointed to me and said you're inferior, but can I tell you that preachers can say things without saying things sometimes. Come on, somebody. It's a new season. It's a new season. It's a new season of power, of authority, of anointing, of revelation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so I believe in 2017 that God is getting ready to open another door in this church, another door of utterance. It's just about time, RPA. God is getting ready to speak through you and to open a door so that miracles will begin to take place. Revelation will begin to be absorbed and received, not because you knocked down a door, not because you were frustrated and tried to shove it down somebody's throat but the Holy Ghost is getting ready to open the other door no wonder we better watch for it it's not enough to pray you better watch what is the door of utterance Paul said so that I can speak the mysteries of Christ it's not enough it's not enough just to believe them God is going to open a door for you to begin to speak those truths Hallelujah. Hear me today. God is going to begin to move in your life like never before. If you thought you felt a difference after receiving your commission, if you thought you felt a difference in anointing, get ready. Because when the door opens, all you've got to do is step across and there's going to be fresh anointing that you've never known before to speak with a clarity, to speak with an anointing like you've never experienced. Hallelujah. Look at verse 4. That I may make it manifest, these mysteries of Christ, as I ought to speak. Can I tell you, the Holy Ghost will take uh, somebody that's uh, just tongue-tied and stammering and doesn't know how to put the words together. The Holy Ghost is about to get a hold of your words, uh, is about to anoint you uh, as you step uh, through the door of utterance uh, that he's going to open very shortly for you. Uh, You've been uh, uh, seeking the things of God. You've been allowing yourself to absorb the mysteries and the revelations of God. But get ready because the Holy Ghost is going to get a hold of you. He said you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Why? So that you can be a witness. So that you can be a witness. Hallelujah. And so get ready. You're going to speak. But here's what we've got to understand. Verse 5 says, walk in wisdom toward them that are without. Redeeming the time. In other words, don't waste your time. Can I tell you that somebody that's not hungry is not going to be forced to eat. Come on. Just because you want them to be hungry is not enough. Have you ever tried to force feed a child that just will not eat? 
You can pull them up to the table. You can threaten their life. <laughs> and they are just not. I mean, they are going to make life miserable before they eat that food. <laughs> Come on. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. Hear me today. We've been trying to force feed people that we love, but they're not hungry. They're not hungry. God is opening doors. And it, it may not be the door. It may never be the door that you want to open. It may never be the people that you want to be hungry. Your family may never come to a place where they're willing to pay the price and to sacrifice for the truth that God is speaking in this day and hour in order to be part of the bride, to be part of Basilea. Your family may never get to that place, but God is opening a door somewhere over here. Are you going to be ready? Are you going to be distracted with the people that you've wanted to force feed with the doors that you've been trying to knock down or are you going to watch for the other door that God is about to open over here for somebody that's been saying Lord I know there's more would you send me somebody would you send me God somebody that would explain make manifest the truth of the word of God you see we've got to walk in wisdom the, the scripture that we read earlier in the seventh chapter of the book of Matthew Jesus said don't give that which is holy to the dog don't cast your pearls before swine. All they're going to do is turn on you. Verse 6 says this, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. I want you to get a hold of this today. The answer that God is about to give to you to make manifest the revelation and the mysteries of Christ is going to be different. for every individual that God puts in your path. So, get ready to receive a word from the Holy Ghost. That's why you've got to have the Holy Ghost power in order to be a proper witness. Because, did you know that the book of Acts, the word of God said, don't worry about what you're going to speak when you're brought before the magistrates and when you're brought, when you're arrested and brought. And that wasn't theoretical for Paul and Silas. It wasn't theoretical for some of the apostles that were arrested for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have family who's been arrested arrested in, in various countries, in China, in, in, in different places. But I've never experienced that. I've never been put in jail for preaching the word of God. But hear me today, God is bringing you to a place. I don't know, there may come a time when they pull me out of this church for preaching the word of God and preaching the truth about Jesus Christ. There may come a time when I have to make a decision. Are you going to preach or are you going to, uh, you know, back down? But can I tell you today, by the grace of God and while there's one breath left in this body I'm going to preach the word of God I'm going to preach the name of Jesus I'm going to preach about the blood of Calvary that changed my life and I know that it can change yours I'm going to preach to a, a lost and dying community that this salvation is for whosoever will. I'm going to preach to a church that is fast going into Laodicea that you don't have to go that direction. But God has opened the door for you to brand new truth and revelation. But church, here's what I've come to tell you today. Begin to watch. Begin to pray like you've never done before because there's a brand new door getting ready to open. You've been frustrated. You've been wondering you've been confused God why would you give this to me why would you allow me to have this word when I can't be it seems like nobody wants to hear it I can't find anyone that will receive it and God is speaking to you today you weren't prepared you weren't ready but I brought you through some things through 2015 through 2016 there were some things that I had for you to experience to change you to empower you to cause you to be who you are today. Quit saying 2016 was a bad year. Quit saying I can't wait to get out of it. Can I tell you, you wouldn't be where you are. If God hadn't allowed you to walk through some things, can I tell you today, those things, they may have been meant to take you down, but look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. Look where you are today. Look at the miracles that God has worked in your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's a door that is getting ready to open. And when it does, speak with wisdom. Let your speech be always with grace. Be graceful 
in your speech. You don't have to make people mad just for the sake of making people mad. You don't have to threaten what people believe. Just speak the truth. You know what the word says? It says, speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. I've heard a whole lot of messages from behind the pulpit. Hopefully not in this church, but in churches growing up, I've heard a lot of messages behind the pulpit that didn't have anything to do with loving me. Matter of fact, I left that place feeling beat up and hated. But the word says, speak the truth in love. Let your speech be with grace, seasoned with salt. The Holy Ghost is going to give you the proper method and the proper version of the word. Does that mean that you're, you, you, you know, you, you put salt in something that is diluting it? No, salt doesn't dilute. Salt seasons. Hear me today. God is not going to give you a diluted word so that you don't hurt somebody's feelings. No, the truth is the truth. But when you season it with salt, somebody's going to receive that word that wouldn't otherwise be able to. Brother Nate, would you come? Hallelujah. God has revealed his word to us, and we've spent two years growing in these revelations. But there's a brand new door getting ready to open for you. Would you stand today in the presence of God? Hallelujah. 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 I believe that people will be drawn into this church. We've had prophecies over this church. You know, it's easy uh, to prophesy good things and normal things for people. You know, when, when you're an evangelist, it's a pretty safe bet to prophesy over the church. You're about to be blessed and you're about to grow and you're about to, you know, have blessings of God. You know, who's going to argue with you? right pretty safe bet but there have been some folks that I believe have some depth to them that have spoken over us I've come to a place where I'm not real concerned about how how big we are God has chastised me for looking at numbers because it's Laodicea that's caught up in numbers I don't want to have anything to do with that so I've come to a place where I'm thankful you know, I'd rather have a handful of diamonds than a truckload of garbage. <laughs> I've pastored a lot of riffraff over the years. I have. And we've tried to love them. We've tried to bring them along. We've pleaded with them. We've helped them every way possible. But there came a time when the Spirit of God pruned them off. Pruned them off because they, weren't, they were never going to come into the things that this church was destined for. Are you hearing me, church? <laughs>